uh, courageous leadership. Uh, there are some notes there available in your bulletin. I encourage you to grab that uh, this morning. Uh, courageous leadership. If I were to ask you uh, what is the definition of leadership, I probably would get a plethora of different responses as to what you feel leadership is. Uh, there are many in history that have tried to define leadership, and some definitions are great. Uh, and I want to share some of those with you this morning. For example, Warren Bennis said this, Leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. Uh, I think that's, that's a good definition. Uh, John Quincy Adams said this, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. I think that's another great definition. Andrew Carnegie said this, no man will make a great leader who wants to do it all himself or get all the credit for doing it. There's something amazing about great leaders who, who are able to lasso people together to a broader vision, much bigger than themselves. And I like this one, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte said this, a throne is only a bench covered with velvet. Uh, we believe biblically that leadership is all about servanthood. We are servant leaders. We are servants of the Most High God. Now, you might be sitting here this morning thinking, I'm not sure I'm a leader. I'm not sure that uh, God has given me that ability. Well, I believe that one of the most simplest definitions of what leadership is, is this. Leadership is influence. And so if you are a parent you have an opportunity to influence, which means you have the potential to be a leader. Uh, in your workplaces, you have a potential to be a positive influence to that work environment. Uh, if you're a student, you have potential to influence your peers and your classmates in school. And so at the end of the day, every single one of us has the potential to be a leader because leadership is influence. Now, we bring all our opinions every time we gather as a community. We bring our opinions specifically this morning as to what we think leadership is. But here's the deal. Because we are a community that is based on Scripture, we bring all of our opinions to the Word of God. We bring all of our experiences to the Word of God. We bring in all our ideologies and philosophies to the Word of God. And my prayer is that the Word of God is what we filter all of, all of our opinions through. That at times, Joel might have an opinion that when he brings it to the Scripture, his opinion might need to change a little. It might need to be tweaked a little bit. So our belief system, our values, what we really believe needs to be formed by Holy Scripture. Would you agree this morning? Would you agree? Okay. That was a question. <laughs> so when we bring our, our, our opinions to the Scripture this morning, I pray that the Scriptures would form our belief as it relates to leadership this morning. And so this morning, uh, we're going to go to the Scripture and look at some characteristics of courageous biblical leaders. You see, I've got some wonderful mentors in my life, people who have molded me, shaped me, have shown me the way. But you know that some of the greatest mentors should be found in Scripture. There are men and women of God that have gone before us, and the Lord has compiled this Scripture for us to learn from those men and women. Now, they weren't perfect men and women. They did some things right, and they did some things wrong. And so when we read about their lives, it's an opportunity to say, Lord, that is something that I desire to emulate in my life. Or at times, we go to the scripture and realize that's not something that pleased the Lord in that individual's life. So Lord, may you protect me from that. And so this morning, I want to cover four different uh, biblical characters that I think will inspire us to be courageous leaders. And so number one, courageous leaders have capacity to love. Courageous leaders, the most effective leaders, have this capacity to love people. 
And one of those individuals that we find in Scripture that had the capacity to love is a young man named Jonathan. Jonathan had a capacity to love. If you want to read his story throughout the week, I encourage you to do so. You'll find it in 1 Samuel 18, 19, and 20. Jonathan was the son of King Saul. Now Saul started off okay, but he then allowed envy and jealousy, and and he allowed uh, his insecurities to get the best of him. But here's Jonathan who stands as a beautiful picture of a young leader who had the capacity to love. You know, many times when we read Jonathan's story, we automatically focus on David. David had a lot of things, a lot of characteristics to, to want to emulate. But Jonathan many times gets overlooked, unfortunately. But Jonathan had a capacity to love. You see, Jonathan, being the son of a king, was the heir apparent to the throne. He was very bright. He was gifted. He was a young, strong leader. And as teenagers, he befriended a young man by the name of David. And David was the recipient of Jonathan's genuine love. Even though, think about this, consider this this morning. Even though Jonathan could have viewed David as a threat to his own inheritance. You see, Technically, Jonathan should have been the next to come into power. But yet God had called his friend David. Now, Jonathan in that moment had an opportunity to either feel insecure about that, threatened by that, similar to what his father was living like. But Jonathan had a capacity to love. He had a genuine love for his friend David. He did not view David as a threat to his own inheritance, But Jonathan never sacrificed his relationship with David to protect his own future. You see, Jonathan understood the importance of love as a leader. See, Jonathan understood that it wasn't about him. It was about the role that God had called him to play, the role that God had called David to play, the role that God had called others to play, And he wasn't going to feel threatened by his friend David, but rather he wanted to protect David from his very own father. He wanted to encourage David. He wanted to strengthen David because David was his friend. So how do we apply this capacity to love in our own lives inspired by the life of Jonathan? You see, as leaders, may we never sacrifice our relationships at the expense of our own personal advancement. May we never get so preoccupied and focused on our own reputation, on our own success, that we sever critical relationships in our lives. You see, may leaders never view people simply as tools to use in order to advance their cause or vision. May people in the eyes of leaders, never be simply looked at as a tool for their own purposes and for their own advancement. But may we have this beautiful capacity to love people genuinely, to want to protect them, to want to lead them, to want to encourage each other. That's what Jonathan did. You see, the the scriptures teach us that the real test of our leadership is the test of love. You see, the measuring rod by which our lives and my life and and leadership will ultimately be assessed is that of love. That's why the Apostle Paul made it very clear in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul was a great leader. I want to get to him in a few minutes. But he said this in chapter 13 of Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor, and I surrender my very own body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. What's Paul saying? He's saying, you can do great exploits, you can be a great leader, and you can be a a leader filled with vision, 
But if you do not love the people, it amounts to nothing. That's challenging, isn't it? And here's a question for all of us to consider this morning. Would I rather be known as a person of love or a person of vision? We're going to unpack that in our small groups throughout the week. And, and, and as I was pondering this question in my own life this week, I thought this. You see, when you love, when a leader loves the people, the people that God has put around you, whether it's your co-workers, whether it's your family, whether it's your, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ, when you love the people, out of that love will birth a vision for them. Because we learned last week that where there is no vision, the people die. Well, if you love somebody, why would you want them to die? And so, because we love people, there comes this moment where a vision is birthed so that the people can be reached, encouraged, strengthened, and ultimately led to the arms of Christ. But when leaders think first vision, what can happen is they forget to love the people. And so Jonathan is a beautiful picture of a leader who had the capacity to love. He put his own advancement, his own potential heir to the king, his own power, so that he can encourage a friend who became king. Jonathan was okay with taking the behind-the-scenes perspective because he had a capacity to love. It wasn't about him. It was about the kingdom, which was much bigger than himself. Number two this morning, courageous leaders have integrity. Courageous leaders have integrity. And when I thought of this, this very important characteristics characteristic, I thought of a man named Joseph. Joseph had integrity. And I encourage you this week to even read the life of Joseph. You'll find it in Genesis chapter 37 all the way to the end of Genesis chapter 50. An amazing story. You see, Joseph's rise to power and influence can only be described as lightning speed. This young man had enormous success really quickly in his life. He rose up the ranks very quickly. Well, when there is such an ascent, it often leads to pride, arrogance, and the assumption that one is an, an exception to the rules. When somebody rises in the ranks and rises in power so quickly, they are more vulnerable and more susceptible to falling into the snare of pride and arrogance to the point where they begin to think that the rules are not for them. They are exempt. They're just for everybody else. But because of my power, I'm exempt by those rules. Well, Joseph showed the opposite. Rather than allowing power and success to corrupt him, he actually showed integrity and character. You see, Joseph remained uncorrupted by power. Joseph avoided financial impropriety. He avoided political scandal. He avoided sexual seduction. He stayed unstained to the end. I want to give you an example of this. In Genesis 39... The king had given him all that he had. Potiphar said, you are an amazing young leader. Everything that, 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 that Joseph touched seemed to go well. It brought success into the people that he served. And so it came to the point where Potiphar gave it all over to him. You rule over it. You manage it all because you are a highly talented leader. Something happened. Unfortunately, Potiphar's wife had an eye for this young leader. And she, every day, the scriptures tell us in chapter 39 of Genesis, that she was tempting him to have sexual relations with her. And notice what it says in verse 8 of Genesis 39. He refused. He said this, with me in charge, he told her. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. 
He's talking to Potiphar's wife. Because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. That is a sign of integrity. It's a sign of character. Some have defined character or integrity as who you are when no one is looking. Doing the right thing, even though you know nobody will ever know what you did. Doing the right thing in those moments. Show and reveal the amount of character and integrity. Well, I don't have time to go through the whole story of this amazing leader named Joseph, but his very own brothers beat him up because of their own envy and jealousy, and they left him to die in a ditch, and then they sold him into slavery. And at the end of the story in chapter 50, the brothers realize their sin. They've come to grips with with their negative attitude and and they're begging joseph because now he's the leader of the day they're begging him for their for his mercy and notice what joseph does this would have easily been a moment for joseph to say for what you did to me i don't want anything to do with you in fact i have the power to inflict you to death but look what joseph does it shows his integrity and character genesis 50 starting at verse 19 says But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid, brothers. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Does not that challenge you? This is a man of integrity. This is a man of character. That though somebody else, his very own brothers, didn't show any character and integrity towards him, he wasn't going to stoop himself down to that kind of attitude and that kind of action. But rather, he was going to stand tall with character and integrity. And he repaid evil with good. That is a picture of of integrity and courageous leaders have integrity and so I thought to myself as I studied the the life of Joseph this week what was Joseph's secret to a life of integrity what was it that caused them to have such deep character in his life and this is what I one of the points that I came up with Joseph saw his leadership as a holy stewardship he saw his leadership as a holy stewardship for which he would someday stand accountable to God for. He understood that it was God who raised him up the ranks. It was God who enabled him to be in a place of leadership. And at the end of the day, he would stand before God and give an account of how he was a steward of the opportunity and the influence that God had granted to him. So friends, the question becomes for us, when we stand before the Lord and he says to us, how did you lead? How did you lead your family? How did you lead in your workplace? How did you lead in your community? How did you lead amongst the the people of God? What will be our response? My prayer is that we would be able to stand and he would say to us, you were a man or a woman of integrity, of character. In fact, one of the verses that really uh, is important to me is Hebrews 13, 17, and not so much because of the first part of this verse, but rather because of the second part of this verse. But it starts like this, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. That's, we sometimes we're scared of authority. We don't need to be scared of authority or to submit ourselves under authority because it's God's idea. It, it breathes accountability and and, and, and health. But then listen to what it says. These leaders, they keep watch over you as men and women who must one day give an account. That is a huge responsibility. That any time we are given a role of leadership, one day 
we will be held accountable for how we stewarded that, how we managed that. And friends, our integrity and our character will be critical in that moment in time when we stand before the Lord. You see, people who follow our leadership need to have confidence that we're not going to wind up derailed, that we're not living a double life, that I'm not going to be seduced by temptations, that people need confidence in our integrity. The only way to keep from sliding into temptation is to surrender our lives before God each and every day. Each and every day. And pray that God would enable us with His power. I don't know about you, but there are moments where I feel so overwhelmed with the task at hand. But I need to daily go to the Lord. Lord, I need Your power more than just the, the skill to lead. But Lord, I want Your character in me. I want integrity. I want to be able to make the right choices at the right time for the purpose of advancing your kingdom and not my own. You see, every leader, let's be honest this morning, every individual this morning has a wandering, rebellious part in our life. Every single one of us has a shadow life. How many of you would agree with that this morning? About 80% of us. It's true. Let's be honest. All of us have this shadow life, this flesh part of us that doesn't want to please God. And so that's why we need to go to God every day to ensure that that part of our life gets knocked out, doesn't prevail, but rather that the work of the Spirit in me prevails. See, every leader has this shadow part and it wants to surface out of all of our hearts from time to time. We need to fight the undercurrent of our hearts with great tenacity and spiritual discipline. A great picture of this tenacity, this fighting of our shadow life comes from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He said this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man or a woman running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, no, he says. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others... After I have led others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. That is an amazingly important passage of Scripture, isn't it? For every leader that is here today. Paul's saying, I literally, he uses a boxing term, give my body a knockout blow because there's so much at stake. That as I speak of the gospel to others, that at the end of the day, my shadow life wouldn't control me that in essence would disqualify me from the prize. This young man, Joseph, he understood this. He understood integrity. And he was courageous because of his integrity. Uh, I'm sure all of us have heard every year, revelers, let me illustrate this point even further. Every year, revelers from around the world head to a place called Pamplona, Spain. And they take part of the running of the bulls. Have you seen this? This is unbelievable. The festival draws hundreds of thousands of people from around the world to Pamplona, a city of around 300,000. I believe there's an image there. Fifteen people have been killed in the bull run since records began in 1911. And the most recent death occurred only five years ago when a Spanish man was gored by one of the bulls. Well, here's the deal. This man by the name of Bill Hillman, a 32-year-old Chicago-based uh, journalist, is an expert on the event. He even co-authored a book subtitled How to Survive the Bulls of Pamplona. So, I mean, this guy got it. He knows how to navigate the streets amidst the bulls. He writes a manual on how to survive. But on July 3rd, 2014, so just a few months ago, 
just knowing about bull running, even knowing enough to write a, a book about it, wasn't enough. You see, a 1,320-pound fighting bull named Bravito lagged behind the pack just before entering the city's bull ring at the end of a rain-slicked run in the annual festival. At the opportune time, this bull named Bravita gored Bill Hillman, the author, the one who should have known how to navigate through. He, he was gored in the right thigh and 35-year-old Spanish man right in the chest. Both men recovered, but the co-author of Hillman's book told the New York Times, we will probably need to update the book. You see, here's, here's the point. We could have grown up in church all of our lives. We could have even received a Bachelor of Theology and a Master's in Christian Studies. And we, can, and we have some of this stuff memorized. But at the end of the day, what's in our heart? Because you can have it in your mind. But as it seeped into your heart, has it transformed your heart where your actions and reactions are pleasing to the Lord? God calls courageous leaders to be men and women of integrity because you can even write the manual and yet be disqualified at the end of the day. Number three, courageous leaders have boldness. Courageous leaders obviously have boldness. And the biblical character I want to highlight this morning is Esther, an amazing woman who is an amazing leader. Esther exemplified boldness. You see, Esther was thrust into leadership. She wound up at the crossroads of her people's destiny. Her people were the Jewish community. There was a, a horrible, evil man by the name of Haman who had a plot to destroy the entire Jewish community. And it was in that moment that God had called Esther to stand before the king to advocate on behalf of the Jewish community. And to stand before the king was a risky act. If you weren't invited to meet with the king, you dared not go into his chambers because that would have potentially meant your death. And so here's Esther. She had a choice. Risk her life by pleading her people's case before a dangerous king or she could simply protect her position and walk away from the crisis at hand. She could have simply said, this is somebody else's problem. Why do I need to risk my life? Somebody else could figure it out. She doesn't. After asking the entire local Jewish community to fast and to pray for her for three days and nights, she said this, when this is done, when we're done praying and fasting, I will go to the king, and even though it is against the law, and listen to what she says, and if I perish, I perish. Talk about courage. Talk about boldness. Talk about conviction. Talk about understanding the call that God had placed in her life. Esther put it all on the line. She was willing to lose status. She was willing to lose her position. She was willing to lose her perks and her security, even her life, to do what God had called her to do. You see, Esther, she believed that certain values were worth living and dying for. And so the question becomes today, do you have certain values that cause you to live for them and for to potentially die for them? Is there something in your heart that gets you up in the morning and keeps you up late at night because you so believe in it? Esther exemplified that. I want you to reflect on that because every single person, God has a special appointment over your life to accomplish. What is it? Once you think about that and, and maybe you even have some responses to that, do those things that really matter to you matter to God? Do they? If they don't matter to God, I wonder if we should reevaluate this. Because God has woven you together for a purpose, to accomplish great things, 
And so the things that really matter to us should be the things that really matter to God. Things that we would be willing to live for and even die for. Esther believed that certain values were worth living and dying for. Number four this morning. Courageous leaders have intensity. Another word might be passion. Courageous leaders have this part about their life that is really intense. It's, it's really focused. It's really filled with passion. And passion can be exemplified in a variety of different ways. It doesn't have to be loud. And it, 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 passion is real deep rooted in our hearts. Well, the Apostle Paul had intensity. He had an amazing intensity. You see, when you read the story of the Apostle Paul, the intensity of his commitment to the ongoing ministry of Christ is obvious. I mean, listen to some of these things he said. In Acts 20, 24, he says, I do not consider my life as dear unto myself. Another translation says, I don't consider my life nothing to me. And then he goes on, only that I would achieve the mission that I have received from the Lord. Really, that's what really matters to me. You feel the intensity coming out of him. 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he says, I will gladly spend and be completely spent for the sake of the church. He tells that to the church of Corinth. I will do whatever it takes to build the church of Christ. He says in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. 1 Corinthians 9.24, In a race there is only one winner. When I run a race, I do so to win. You see, his words are dripping with intensity, with passion. This was not some... A lethargic, apathetic leader. And friends, if there's one thing that I have a difficult time tolerating is apathy. It's just malaise in our spirituality, in our belief as to what God has called us to do. Friend, may you ask the Lord, Lord, give me that passion. Give me that intensity of the Apostle Paul in my life. Near the end of his life, Paul states, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. I'm sure all of us in this room would want to say that one day. I ran with the most amount of intensity that I could muster in my life. Help me get to the end of my life knowing I fought the good fight with every ounce of strength I possess, that I finished the mission that was entrusted to me, that I kept the faith and never compromised. You know, they say that the best athletes are the ones who have intensity. The ones who have intensity are usually the best athletes. You see, the stakes of the kingdom are immeasurably higher than the stakes of professional sports. The outcome of our game has eternal significance. The payoff is forever. So don't you think that deserves intensity out of our lives? Don't you think that deserves passion and focus as illustrated in the life of the Apostle Paul? I conclude with this, and maybe Pastor Chris can come on up. I, I feel that sometimes one of the greatest obstacles in every leader's life is destructive fear. Do you ever deal with fear, friends? You see, destructive fear is the kind of fear that tricks us into believing beyond what is reasonable. It tricks us to think that the world is this ominous and dangerous place and we dare not enter it. You see, history is filled with men and women who said no to destructive fear and changed the world. But imagine if they had given in to the paralyzing effects of fear on their lives. For example, imagine if the Apostle Paul, fearing resistance or maybe even rejection by the people, choosing to just stay home rather than embarking on the missionary journeys that took the message of Christ throughout the known world. Just imagine if he just allowed fear to grip his heart. Imagine Rosa Parks submitting to the bus driver's command to give up her seat to a white person. 
Imagine if she allowed that fear to paralyze her from taking action. Imagine Nelson Mandela looking the other way when he witnessed and experienced apartheid in South Africa. Because he just didn't want to make a fuss or instead he spent 27 years imprisoned and brought apartheid onto the world's radar, helping end the centuries-old regime of oppression. Imagine if Mr. Mandela just said, you know what, I just, there's just too much danger there. Imagine if Malala Yousafzai, passively quitting school because she was too frightened, by the death threats she received from Taliban extremists who abhor education for girls. Instead, Malala, she became even more vocal about education rights for children and for women. She even survived the 2012 assassination. She was nominated Nobel Peace Prize nominee in both 2013 and 2014. That's a courageous leader who didn't allow herself to be gripped with destructive fear to the point of being paralyzed to do anything. Imagine our church, fully aware of the vision and mandate God has placed on us, but too paralyzed by fear of the unknown. Fear of misunderstanding or fear of overcommitment or fear of never moving forward. We would never move forward in making room to reach more people to the glory of God. But I am grateful for a church that is strong and courageous, who will not allow destructive fear to hold us back from what God has called us to accomplish. Imagine yourself fully aware of the mission and vision God has placed in your heart to advance his kingdom in this world, yet held hostage to phobias, irrational worries, destructive fears of failure, harm, or rejection? Friend, ask yourself this question. If you don't fulfill the mission God assigned to you, who will? Who will? So my friends, may this church be filled with courageous leaders, Leaders who have a capacity to love. Leaders who have integrity. Leaders who have boldness. and Leaders who have intensity and passion. Take this moment, maybe if you can bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to pray a prayer over our, all of our lives. Jesus, we've opened your scripture. We've brought our own opinions and our own ideologies. God, I pray that our hearts have been open to you forming us as it relates to the kind of people, the kind of leaders you've called us to be. I pray now that the, the seed of your word that has landed in our hearts, that it would begin to germinate and grow into something beautiful. God, you have called our church to great and mighty things. May we not allow destructive fear to take hold of our hearts, but may we stand tall so that thousands of people would be reached with the message of Christ. Lord, I pray a blessing over each individual. Lord, you have a specific task for each and one of us to accomplish. May we be compelled by intensity, a capacity to love, integrity. May it just flow out of our lives, in our everyday life, at work, at play, at home, in our community. I ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody says, Amen.